What's up, Jordan? What's up, Sam? How you doing, man? I'm good, bro. I'm very excited to have our guest on today, Mr. Devin DeHaven, the executive producer at Push Live. Uh, I've had the fortune of being able to work with Devin, um, all-star player, helping build an all-star team and all-star products. They essentially have built uh, to live streaming software, cloud-based, cloud-based broadcast software that enables you to essentially um, bring down the cost of doing major live stream productions and ensure that you're able to reach as many people as possible. So there's a lot more inner workings as to what makes that possible, but they're responsible for powering um, a lot of the world's biggest live streams from Insomniac, uh, one of the world's biggest promoters, all of their virtual online festivals, to Digital Mirage, to Beatport. Um, I'm sure you have all seen that there's been nonstop, uh, uh, never-ending stream of live streams <laughs> and uh, virtual music festivals. Devin and his company and his software product are, are literally at the forefront of doing this. I think he's been able to work with incredible artists and we had the opportunity to collaborate on a, uh, ban- our good friends at Bands in Town doing the Bands in Town Music Marathon where we had 16 artists over the course of two days. So um, I think what I love most about this episode is, I mean, he's been in the, the world of media for a while. I mean, he went on tour with Eminem back in the day and was doing BTS videos and selling them the, I mean, DVD series and been doing a lot of live stream broadcasts and helping manage productions with with like film like broadcast trucks where they'd have massive crews at these major music festivals with major trucks running the, the end-to-end production so for him to have pivoted and taken all his knowledge into building a cloud-based software product that enables uh, the same level of production quality as what would once take a 50-person crew um it was really really cool to see so i think his perspective on just the general live streaming as it stands what's next for the music industry when it comes to live streaming what makes live streaming stand out how can you as an artist or music industry professional think about and approach live streaming all the way um i think his his, his perspectives there are invaluable what do you think jordan yeah, so the Wild Wild West right now, and he admits this a lot during the episode. I mean, not the Wild Wild West. The, the live streaming business is the Wild Wild West right now. So um, there's a lot of things that we're still understanding about it, but it's great to get his perspective because one, you know, he makes people aware of kind of he 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 knows the the most recent updates. I trust him on the most recent updates. So you not only hear that, but you also hear where the business is right now um, in terms of live streaming, what you can do with it. And we get into a few layers of it. So we obviously go over what makes a live stream successful, but we also talk about distribution and how important that is to your live stream. We also talk about ways to market it. And obviously he says during the episode, it could change next week, but that's one of the exciting things about live streaming. So we get really exploratory in this episode. Um, We talk about what's been working, what hasn't been working. They got to get everybody up to speed on what they should be doing with their live stream and and not only that, but what content wins on a live stream. So I'm really excited for people to hear this. I know there's a lot of actionable insights that people can take from it. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think one other thing, too, that I wanted to talk about is uh, last week had a really awesome uh, virtual happy hour with the, the members of our Patreon. So the Music Business Podcast patrons, I think, incredible group of people. We were uh, all music industry professionals across the range of their career. We're sharing really unique tips, tricks, different things we were seeing in the industry, ways in which we can accelerate streams and uh, how to go about effectively targeting the appropriate demographics. I found it to be a very fun conversation and as always, super grateful for you guys' support. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I encourage you to go to musicbusinesspodcast.com slash community. But without any further ado, let's get into the show today with Mr. Devin DeHaven, the live streaming gangster himself. (laughs) Oh, gee. (laughs) <laughs> gang gang Devin what's happening man welcome to the show what's up guys what's up nice background there you got it going on yeah we out here today first release um I, know, well, I feel like I should I feel like I should I feel like I should have done more with mine I'm sorry it's just an empty yeah. whiteboard so yeah. next time next time that's yeah. how you learn <laughs> um, well super excited to have you on man I know we've had the opportunity to collaborate a couple of times and I think it's been really amazing to see what you've done during uh quarantine and and uh, no it's interesting crazy unfortunate challenging times for society but i think in the business of live streaming there's undoubtedly been a major boom and i think uh it's really been one of the only ways in which artists can really connect with their fans so it's uh sure you've had your your hands full this quarantine 
Yeah, we've we've been busy. We uh, unexpectedly busy, right? We figured right now, actually, right now on this day, we'd be in Montreux doing Montreux Jazz Fest on the ground, like busy yeah. streaming. So it's kind of mm-hmm. a different different world, you know. So yeah, for sure. The, the summer vacation slash work three months on the road is gone. So yeah. Know, so I think it's um. I mean, I'm excited to dive into all things live streaming and, and also too, just like building a technology and software business within the music industry. But before that, just for the listeners, I mean, I know you've been in music for a while, also in technology and broadcast for a while. Can you just give a, a quick little um, background on kind of how it's uh, the, the history and how it's led to what you're doing today with Push Live? Right. Uh, I mean, it depends on how far back you want to go, which is going to make me feel ancient. But so <laughs> we we started we started like so. Back in the day, I initially was a music video director, right? And I, and I figured out a way to time everything perfectly wrong. So I became a music video director and got signed to a big company today called Propaganda right as the video market crashed and it went from million dollar videos to like nothing, right? So trying to figure out what to do, I have made friends with a couple different artists and I actually met Exhibit and he and I talked and we decided to go on the road and shoot a behind the scenes thing at kind of the same time it's like up in smoke tour when they were doing the big production stuff on that. Mm-hmm. We actually were doing more like all access behind the scenes. And we ended up, you know, we were on the anchor management tour with like Eminem and Papa Roach. So we made this, you know, long form 90 minute DVD and put it out on DVD with I think image or Eagle rock at the time. And it sold like 200,000 copies and the business was born. So we ended up doing that for a few years. And then this company called YouTube came along to completely devalue all that behind the scenes footage because it was all free, right? So bad timing number two, right? So, <laughs> so I've destroyed, I've destroyed music videos. Finally now. got it right. This yeah. time. <laughs> right, right, right. So we, we spent a lot of years doing like, you know, content and figuring that world out and doing that aspect. And then I, I went to work for Access TV, uh, directed and produced like 150 live shows over three years there, which we were doing, you know, that's the company owned by Mark Cuban that was very music centric as a network. And started doing like we did uh, Stagecoach, we did uh, New Orleans Jazz Fest. We started doing like on the ground, physical, big truck, two, three truck, 30 cameras spread across the ground, standard host stuff. So like real TV versions of broadcasting. And then the evolution of that kind of was going away from TV to streaming, ended up going to work in, in the founding days of Live by Live when it was like someone's house and helped work with that company for multiple years. And now I'm with this company, uh, Push, that the technology in it is actually pretty amazing. So I, my initial role in this was to tear the technology apart, right? Being an old school truck guy, TV guy, come in and tear this cloud stuff apart, you know, show that it doesn't work. So, and when we put it through all its stress tests and figured it out, it was about 85% great, right? Like it was really surprising to me because I'm stuck in my ways in production a little bit sometimes, but the tools allowed me to really open my mind. And then we spent another year fixing those other elements that were really important to production, which all led up to EDC uh, Mexico, working with the Insomniac team, where we, the year before we did, you know, TV trucks, 10,000 feet of fiber, 80 crew, the whole thing. This year, back in February, right before the virus, we had no TV trucks. We did a flight pack on each stage, film cameras, small switcher, and then we took it all to the cloud and built all the shows in the cloud, which got rid of fiber, got rid of trucks, and put our crew down to 20. So mm. it's that whole economic landscape. And even more interestingly, it, in the year before, we had two encoders on site, went to two channels, did that. And this year, we did four stages. So we had four, four, four channels and a fifth channel for curated. We duplicated those and geofenced that to Mexico with Dos Equis branding. And then we did the same thing on Facebook. And then we did a Twitch, a Mixer, Rest in Peace Mixer. You just heard today that they're no longer next month. So Mixer's going away. Not They weren't getting big viewership anyway. And uh, TikTok. And so we went to 26 total channels. And we ended up with massive, massive viewership from a smaller front print and less cost, which is the combination all the promoters have been looking for, right? Yes. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Yeah. And then it's... Uh... I mean, beyond, I mean, was the intention, the intention was really to, to bring down costs and help reach more people. And then 
Next thing you know, it's the live stream every single day from artist homes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I remember week one, I mean, week one, I, th- I think like it was like shock, right? No one knew what to do. And right. one thing I haven't been in the music business for a long time is the music business is the best at adapting, right? Like over everything that's happening all the time. So about a week into it, you know, everyone was like, you know, fuck it, we're going to do this. We're going to figure out a way to make this happen. And we started talking to people. And Insomniac was a leader. I'll, I can tell you from day one, when they called us and they wanted to set up a 24-hour network of all like, the last five years of archive, they were really committed to it. They had no revenue source for it. They had no sponsors. They had no way to justify it. But their brand was so important that they wanted to get that out to the fans. So we, I think within about 24 hours, because they're, all their stuff's on Glacier, at, which is Amazon storage facility, we're an Amazon back tech. We were able to download five years of archive in a very short period of time, get it on air that night, and we're running the graphics lower thirds. And we did a 24 hour network that as of last week, we opened the Twitch account with them at EDC Mexico and we crossed like 45 million views on Twitch last week. So wow. it's been a pretty big impact. And, they, and, and it's not just that though. I mean, they've been doing all their brands live and, and the, those have all been weaved into the stream. They've really mm-hmm. made an amazing effort to entertain their fans in spite of probably what the numbers were against the scope of what they're doing. Right. Which is right. So you obviously have seen a lot of live streams happen since the pandemic has started. Um, and I would, you know, you obviously do professional live streams and I feel like everyone's sort of like, you can't just do IG live streaming. Well, what are some of the ways that artists and independent artists can make their live streaming more, um, I guess, engaging for their viewers? And how do you separate, a, a, I guess, a basic sort of live stream with, with one that you think is worth paying for? Right. I mean, that's the big question now, right? Like, so mm-hmm. we went through that whole period of artists just needing to be out there. You know, right. now everything's turned to monetization. So we went from zero talk seven, eight weeks ago about money and, and ticket sales and revenue because also no one knew how long this was going to last, right? So. Mm-hmm. Everyone felt like you were just kind of buying time. But the reality is, you know, maybe next June we're back on, on grounds of real events. So, mm-hmm. so I guess, it, and it's, it's, it's interesting too, because then the tools have evolved too. Like we, we, we work a ton with Twitch, right? So Twitch is a big mm-hmm. company we work with. We also work with YouTube and Facebook. Instagram is really kind of problematic because it, you get amazing engagement in amazing fans you can authenticate people so you know if that's really michelle obama or not so there's all Mm -hmm. these advantages but unless you have a sponsor there's no real monetizing tools and no way as we learned sam to cleanly (laughs) do a broadcast when we destroyed one of the biggest designers in the world stream Uh, in fairness it was his own (laughs) destruction and that's a funny story in itself but yeah but but there's no good way i mean i've been on a call with them where they said we are not a company that's going to do professional broadcast streaming into uh, Instagram. It's a thing you do with your phone. It's supposed to be spontaneous, which, you know, if you watched, if you watched Versus this week, it was on Apple and it streamed to, it streamed in, but it was out of sync. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was an interesting thing to see it happening, but it just didn't work well. I have my own conspiracy theories around that that I'll leave out of this. But, <laughs> but, but you know, it's, so the, uh, shorter answer, uh, this was a long answer to your short question. Um, it's about, it's interesting. The Twitch model is really interesting, right? Like YouTube is the the biggest company and has the most real reach, but the Twitch tools are starting to make a way to make a living, you know, Mm -hmm. that aren't in other places yet. And we're seeing, we're seeing with the artists that we're working with, you know, the ability to be a self thing. Like, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, there's going to be, there's a really big producer. I can't say his name yet that we're doing a Twitch thing with that. He is going to have his own channel be on there three or four days a week. Mm-hmm. And not someone that you would expect to be a Twitch musicianer or gamer, or whatever you call him. And, but he's going to engage with his audience and depending on your subscription base, you can make touring like money doing that. If you can build your audience. So mm-hmm. there's, not, there's not a lot of opportunities out there to do it. You know, like, like Twitch is one, pay-per-view is another, but pay-per-view is tough, right? Like, I think pay-per-view is great for those mid-level bands that don't, you don't get to see a lot. But if right. you search 5 million Katy Perry videos, it's hard to imagine someone's going to pay for a ticket for her. I think it's more niche than that, right now at least. 
So I know it doesn't answer your question, but we're learning every day to what the answers are because the monetization just became super important, you know? Right. Yeah, and from yeah. what I hear from that, it seems like the tool is almost as important as the content itself. Like, how are you, you know, if, there's a difference between putting things on Instagram, but the same content on Twitch could maybe actually make you some money. Right. And that, and those are decisions people have to make. And, it, and it's right. not how we've been trained. Like, it's like, go to YouTube, go to Facebook, go to where the audience is. And this is different. This is bringing an audience to where you can make money, you know? Right. So, right. Um, For sure. Do you think the, um, I mean, as we do, do you think this live, I mean, it seems interesting because it seems like the live streaming and it, you mentioned the shift to monetization, but early on artists scrambled. There was a major surge in live streaming. And now it's at the point too, where it's like monetization aside, even just for artists in general, it's a little bit harder to justify doing it. Or is it like, I mean, I know certain artists I work with decided we, we saw it, we saw it despite really strong promotion that there was a little bit of a drop off. And I think too, even um, the other people I've spoken with, it's like the first time an artist, if the artist has some significant following, does a live stream, they're likely to get more tune in than the fourth or fifth time, just because it's all this pent up anticipation from the mm -hmm. audience. What do you think will need to happen in order for like live streaming to not become played out? And I think you alluded to some of those great points, but beyond that, are there other factors you keep in mind as this becomes a staple of how fans engage with musicians? Well, I think it's like anything. I think it's like music, right? Like there's a social influence to our behavior, right? So, and, and, and it's weird because before trends would last months or years. Right now, trends are going like 10 days, 14 days total in the world of streaming. So, and, 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 and in the time that we've been in doing this, we have a pandemic going around the world. We have social justice issues. We have all these things that are happening that are taking people's lives. And, and, and they're, they're not, only, not only literally taking their lives, but it's, it's locking people into a place where, you know, where their bandwidth goes is a choice, right? We watched, right. Uh, we watched you know, festivals in the last three or four weeks that are, or events that are really amazing that did lower numbers because they were straight music. But we produced two shows on Twitch that are called Behind the Rhyme that are all, they're all social justice and those went through the roof. Like we had, we had, David Banner on, and David Banner's not on the cover of everything right now, but mm -hmm. it exploded on Twitch. Like it was the hot point of, you know, and, and just, you know, the chats running faster, you can massive viewership. So I think it also, you know, it's deeper than just what we build as tools or what we program as, as what we think content is. It's following the world, right? How do you, you know, Diplo took three weeks off on the shows that we do, but how do you bounce to party music when people are dying in the streets and when, you know, things are happening? Like it's just, I think entertainment follows the vibe of the world. And I think we have to understand that. I mean, it did take a big dip. We saw stuff start to come back this week numbers wise, but I think that's because people are allowing themselves a different bandwidth, you know? So. Right. Right. You know. How do you think live streams will kind of coexist with the, the touring industry as it comes back? That's a really good question. So I think it's twofold. One, I think, that the that that's been proven that high quality productions can be done for much less, right? To start with, so you can, it's you can do big production via cloud, via different ways than you did before. So I think it's going to be hard to convince the bean counters that the old way of doing it, where we spent you know a million dollars doing a weekend festival, is going to be the future of this. Um, but I do think that there's ways that they can help each other, like artists we'll have to find a way to continue a digital footprint because I mm -hmm. think, and this is weird. So I, I like, I look at Diplo, right? So I, I think Wes is great. I think Wes is a very talented person, but he also kind of gets both ends. Sometimes people don't love him, don't like this, don't whatever, but he just spent nine weeks DJing from his house. And it's kind of like, you know, living on a tour bus or going to some kind of battle. He's built a foundation with his fans Right. And they've been through something together. And it's like, there's a whole, and I think that's going to carry on. And I don't know what it's going to look like. And I don't know if it's, there'll still be some home streaming. There'll be more media. He'll spend more time on the Twitch or like Mad Decent Twitch is insane. They do music and gaming and they've created this whole lifestyle brand on Twitch. And I don't think that's going away when this changes. I just think 
there's you got to figure out how to integrate them both. You know, I, at least I think so. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, everything I think a week later changes. <laughs> so right, right. I need to just adapt to it. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. It will be interesting to think about. I mean, I think, um, I mean, Twitch is exciting too. And I know they have the, uh, IRL backpacks is that what it's called where it's the like the streaming in a backpack it has like a uh, cellular like mobile hotspot and camera mm-hmm. and like built-in encoder so trying to lo- lower the barrier of being able to like uh broadcast even even like twitch itself started as like justin tv where it was just this justin Khan uh-huh. like streaming so his wait, whole life right maybe what is what is a twitch circle. backpack sorry for pe- for people who don't know and including it's myself called, it's called an IRL backpack I'm fairly certain I'll double check uh-huh. But what it, it's uh, like a one-stop shop for being able to stream. So in it, it has a mobile hotspot. It has a camera. Oh. Um, and then it has an encoder, which essentially will kind of combine the audio and video feed and broadcast into a specific streaming destination. So you can literally, it's like you have yeah. this backpack with the camera and like wherever you go. Yeah. So um, yeah. and, then I think, yeah. and it com- comes with lead underwear too, in case you want to have kids. Later, you know? So, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, yeah. So I've, we've seen those actually, uh, one, there's a gamer that got himself in a lot of trouble last year at E3 doing that. I think he walked into a restroom. Well, you know, but, but yeah, those are, those are <laughs> part of, part of the world. I mean, it's, but, it, but again, it's interesting. Like content's what matters, right? Like, mm-hmm, right. like, like it, that's the biggest thing. Like, like in, in looking back at the show we did together, right? Like people were interested in that subject. Like it was technically going awry, mm-hmm. but because of the, the brand of the artist, he just said it was how it was supposed to be. And they, and it, because yeah, 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 the brand, yeah. but I'm just saying like the content's what matters. Like to answer your question of how do people that are young acts go on and stream, there's no shortcut. You build an audience, you right. work hard every day, you make good music or you make good content. And you find I mean, cause even if you, know all the tricks and know all the tools and have everything. If your content isn't there, people aren't going to follow you. Or, you know what I mean? Like that's, it, we forget that. Like all the years of work in the music industry, none of it matters. It's just how we deliver the contents changed. Right? Mm, right. It was on cassettes and then it was on CDs and then DVDs and laser discs, whatever those were now, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it's always adapted and digital. And then the industry had to really adjust, adapt, adjust on digital because everyone lost money. It was the end of the world. No one knew what to do because everyone was being bootlegged. That got figured out. Streaming's kind of doing the same thing. It's it's just good content getting to people in ways that enhances their life to watch it. And that's I think the evolution of where it's that to where it's going right now. You know? Yeah, for sure. No, I love that too. I mean, I think when it when you think about that, I mean, when it comes to good content, if you were to try and like demystify that, you mentioned enhance people's lives, but having been in the the content business for a significant part of your career, I mean, like what are the various elements of great content? I mean, it comes back to like, I mean, I'm always a big believer of like of things being organic, right? Like you, you make music cause you love music and then it becomes cool. Not that you get put in a group of people and they say, make a song and turn this great, you know? So good content is, but it's also super subjective, right? Like I have an eight year old son and good content to me and good content to him, Tim are different, <laughs> right? And that's what's great about it. It's like if you go if you go to a Twitch or YouTube, Facebook, any anywhere the content's going on, no matter what you're into or what you, what's important to you, it's there, and mm-hmm. it's easier to find than it's ever been. But the cream always rises to the top, right? Like it's always you're going to watch if you're into DJs. You're gonna you know if you want to watch you watch Porter Robinson. You watch you know like like the stuff that. You know, I mean, Diplo's shows have been turned really fun. We started with Diplo, by the way. When I called his team, uh, because I watched one of his streams, they were doing three cell phones going to three different things from his house. Mm-hmm. And he didn't have signal for one. So we, it, he was doing whatever he had to to get to the thing. He took the technology that was available and using us and other, other tools that we brought to site to make it a business. It went from just him messing around to, you know, that, that channel is over 35 million on Twitch alone from his streaming. Right. So, you know, it, it, and he's good content. He's an entertainer and he's got this whole country thing going now, which is really crazy because he's gone from literally sitting with a couple decks and playing music. Then he went into green screen. Now there's green screen with bales of hay and he's on a country trip. And it's like, <laughs> like it just keeps expanding, expanding. And what's, what's really interesting is like the good artist and the people that know how to do their content well, know how to adapt and grow no matter what the problem is. 
It's not, right. there's a virus, people, are whatever. They just keep building their art and that's what people gravitate towards. And I think it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, I don't know what the answer is, but it's the people that make the real effort that really organically go after stuff, not just because they got a check from some big company to do something, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, well said. That's it. It's a great yeah. answer. Jordan, I think you're muted. You're muted. I'd be, if we were on a live stream, I'd be yelling at you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a, uh, off, off the clock right now, bro. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny when you guys said that. Also, got a push notification to my screen that was like, "You're muted. Unmute yourself." So it's like, <laughs> yeah, oh, it's yeah, like yeah. the computer yelling at me. Everybody yelling at me. But um, we had somebody on a couple weeks ago, Hovain Hilton from um, Cinematic Music Group, and he said one of the best things about this time is that it's really forcing people to be like really creative. So that, that kind of spans to every single part of the industry. I forget what we were talking about in particular. I think we were talking about ways where managers could make money for their artists now, um, but that obviously extends to live streams. And I think from the, Dip, the Diplo story that you just told, he's adapting because he's also not putting any barriers on his creativity and like really thinking outside the box and really like taking every idea that he has seriously. And then from there kind of defining what makes sense for him and what and you know and what and what's organic to him, um, which is what I think is just like a a great lesson from that. Right. So. Yeah. When when it comes to like people and building on that, like people pushing forward and pushing boundaries, and what boundaries or cool technical implementations do you feel have been the most intriguing? I mean, yeah, wow, I mean bales, green screen with bales. Yeah, yeah, no, sets, sets that's a high bar. Yeah, I know that's a really high bar. Well, it's interesting. You just brought up something really interesting, Jordan. Like, and I say this and I feel bad when I say this, but like, I feel like we kind of had gotten into a rhythm in the music business, like make a record, promote a record, do a festival, do shows, see all the same people at all the different events all summer long, you know, and then rinse and repeat. I think oddly, one of the biggest, uh, legacies or pot, I mean, not the right word the biggest legacy to come out of this experience is that it sparked a whole different kind of creativity in people mm -hmm. you know like you know we do it's and, it, and, it, and it's and it's fun again and that sounds terrible to say when people are dying but it is actually fun to create you'll get someone that comes to you and you figure it out and you're doing a shoot and you've got like it was funny because we did we did this thing a couple uh, about a month ago with Selena Gomez. We did it all remotely. We like shot this little music video. It wasn't for live, but she's like crawling around fixing her set and changing her lighting and doing. And then you're sitting in your head thinking, these are all the biggest stars in the world <laughs> doing stuff that they would never think of touching six months ago or whatever. So and and but they're motivated and they're having fun and you're laughing and you're doing things that you wouldn't do in the rest. Of, you know what I mean? Like it's created this new environment. As far as creative, it's tough because as far as tech, like I haven't seen, you know, virtual stuff that matters yet. I haven't seen, you know, like, you know, it's cool. It's like a two minute experience, but are you really going to watch a 90 minute concert wearing headphones and it, it you know, or, or, I mean, uh, VR goggles. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah it's like, it, it's, and that kind of is an, is a testament to back to that. The content is what's important, right? Cause if you're doing all right. this other shit, you're trying to distract from something else. Like, like if when I'm, when we did a, like we did a Foo Fighter thing on the weekend, that's just the music and period. You watch it because of the music, you're not worried about if there's crazy VR or even engagement that matter. It's still just back to the art of what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. So as far as the technical advances, I think honestly, you know, as amazing as our tech's been and the other ones that I've seen, it's, it's the humans that are working for us and, and our teams that are, working with these artist teams to come up with creative ways to still deliver to fans and to give them experiences. Like it, it's, it's not a computer that's sitting for, I don't know how many hours a week my team works and does that stuff. It's the people. And it's, it, it, that's my view. Like the techs, techs are really critical and they make mm -hmm. things easier, but it's the human factor that's going to make this stuff great. You know? Right. Right. Um, there's obviously a lot more live streams now than there ever were before. Right. Um, I feel like before when somebody announced a live stream, um, it obviously was something that was unique to the situation or to the artist. But, um, you know, we've seen artists live stream a lot now that, you know, never touched a live stream beforehand. Uh, so that being said, how do you market your, how do you market a live stream at this point with kind of all of this uh, 
live stream, I don't want to say noise, but live stream, uh, you know, marketing messages to people all at the same time? How do you, how do you market it in order to kind of stand out from, from the pack? Right. I mean, I think, you know, partners like the YouTubes and the Twitches and the Mm -hmm. Facebooks, you know, they have valuable information on understanding the audience and, and, and experience on it. So, you know, I guess some of it comes to like staying in your lane a little bit in our Mm -hmm. world. Like we have become these weird experts on understanding the market, but you still look at their input. You look at management artists, there's, you know, it all starts with the artist, right? Like, so in the case of Diplo, it starts with marketing through him, then it comes through partners and, and you build on it. If you're talking about like grassroots stuff, it's the same thing. It's you're the, the 12 o'clock band at Coachella until you're not right. Like you have right. to, you have to build and you have to grassroots. There's no, you know, the marketing aspect, like when Twitch or YouTube or any of them turn the machine on, you're gonna have a lot of viewers, right? No matter mm-hmm. what, they're going to pipe it to you. But if you notice, if you're on the hero position on Twitch, and we've done, we've had both. We have really great acts, and we have acts that weren't as interesting. You see the numbers. The content decides who stays and who doesn't. They go, it'll get, it'll get people in front of it, but they won't stay unless it's great. You know, traditional marketing. We haven't seen how that works yet. We know sponsors are kind of jumping in, but not. It's weird. Like again, it's just weird. Like every week. You, you think you have this figured out and it changes, right? <laughs> like it's, it's, and then, you know, uh, and then, you know, COVID's going to be gone. Everyone gets excited. Then all of a sudden we have more COVID now than we did five weeks ago. You know, the, the, the police got to stop doing dumb shit in the world. And, and you know what I mean? Like there's so many, there's so many factors that come into play on how people experience life and want to be entertained that you just, we don't know. I mean, it's not like you can put a commercial on or do magazine ads or you're like, right. We're still figuring it out. You know, right. You know, it's a really, again, a really long answer to not an answer, but that's the reality we face. And sometimes we have no idea. Like we did this weekend. We our lineup this weekend. Cause a lot of acts were off. We had two European, we had Moby and we had Robin and Robin's a big old school DJ out of, out of Europe. And they had, I mean, they were, they were pulling 20, 30,000 concurrence on Twitch. Right. You know, like, and, and the people were staying, the chat was going crazy. You know, look at Willie Nelson when he did his event on Twitch. He had like 80,000 concurrent. And this is a gaming thing with like teenagers, you know, mm-hmm. like, so how do you know what works where and what's, it's, it's hard, you know, it's like the old record label days back before, you know, you know, bootlegging came in, record label sold a gazillion records and probably didn't understand half of why they did. You know what I mean? That's, <laughs> that's kind of now it's until it stops, we'll probably figure out more mechanisms of it but right now it's hard to really quantify where it comes from you know right right um, as weird as that sounds yeah no it makes sense i mean it's interesting to see uh very excited to see too the the evolution and i think it's been really exciting to see the fact that like there has been just a lot of just general adoption of live streams and like i mean even just twitch you mentioned uh, i mean their timeline i mean everything's been so accelerated for them like twitch music had these grand ambitions but now there's hundreds of thousands if not millions of people consuming music related content every day week month um that weren't there previously well and more than that there's people that are making a living you know there's yeah there's a lot of people that you know in a time where people need to make livings because of what's going on it's mm-hmm. kind of created this niche white collar world of music you know which is cool right. they may not be making not everyone's making like you know ninja numbers on, yeah. on this but people are making livings and they're feeding their kids and they're supporting their crews that aren't traveling and different things like that. It's interesting too, because like, and not to downplay at all, you know, the, the uh, Netflix or the other big companies, but this has been a weird level set, right? Like you can have a talk show. I can, we can make a show tonight that yeah. goes in front of millions of people on Twitch yeah. because of the tools that are in play and technology changes and everything else where you'd go through like development and money and the whole thing. Like, I can give an example. Like we do a show called behind the rhyme. Right. And that had gone to like Dick Clark and cool Modi was the host and went through all the things and lots of money and never went anywhere and took a year on a decision overnight. It was put on Twitch and it's now gotten like over 3 million viewers and has shows happening with all the, you know, the biggest name, in old school hip hop, yeah. current guys like Ludacris and, and Rick yeah, Ross yeah. and all this. So it just happened, right? Like it level set. We don't need million dollar budgets. We don't need these things. 
And I think the people that are taking advantage of that is really important because if your content's good, it will rise up and then you can do something with it to monetize instead of going through the whole political process of the studio system and everything else that goes on. So Yeah, you know. for sure. That's like one thing I think has really happened a lot during this. And like we mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, people were kind of like, what the fuck am I going to do? I can't go outside. I can't, can't go to shows anymore. Now everybody is realigning with their content strategies and coming to terms with the fact that if they had a good content strategy before they need to make it better, or if they didn't really have a content strategy, then they need to actually build one, you know? Um, So after this, like, I guess this is sort of my forecast. I personally think that we'll just see artists do a lot more for their fans, even after this is over. Cause it's not like, it's not like as soon as it starts and people start putting out great content, they'll be like, Oh, well I can do shows again. Might as well stop everything that I was doing before. It'll be like, all right, well, how do we get these shows and back into the picture and get content at the shows and still, you know, pay attention to the fans that we created and built during this time? You know, a lot of those fans will be first time fans that they built during this time. They, they got to know you on a live stream before they maybe came across your music even, you know. Right. Um, so it'll be like kind of siphoning, I think, siphoning off uh, your content for the different attention that you got, not only during the pandemic, but but afterwards. Um, but I think the whole industry will be better for it once everyone starts getting paid again and figures out, right. figures out to get paid again. So why well, and the pay is important, especially to the, you know, you only read about the stars, right? But there's a right. whole ecosystem of theirs that, you know, live off it. But it's interesting because you said, like you talk about going forward. What I think people, and having toured with artists my whole life, what I pe- think people don't realize as much as like, you know, you, you as a fan, you need that artist, you need the music, you mm. need the life. But the reality is, and it was proven so much by this, is the artist needs the fan, right? They need that reverse energy. They need that, I'm not saying in an ego way, like they need that glow and that, that uh, knowing that people are relating to what they're doing. And I think that was the biggest fear in the beginning of this is like, that's gone. That's just cut off. Not only is your tours over, your, all your plans are over, but you got no connection to what is the most powerful thing to your music, which are the fans right. that you built it on. And I think that's one thing streaming has done well and done better than we could have ever imagined in life by connecting the fan on a level where they can really communicate and be a part of. I mean, again, going to verses, anyone can make a comment and those big stars are calling you out. You know, you go to Twitch, you can literally go back and forth in conversations. It, it, it's taken it to a whole other level that I think somehow the DNA of that, I don't know how it's going to work yet, is going to work itself into on-site and digital world of how we deal with this going forward. I don't, I don't understand it yet, but it's the mix is all there, right? Yeah. Right. No, we had somebody, we were doing a live stream at Bonish and one of the commenters was like, this was kind of like earlier on and when we all shifted to live streaming in COVID and somebody said, let us be grateful that for one time in history, it's like acceptable for us to like ask a DJ a question during their, during their set. Right. So I think that just that, that increased level of like engagement and connection beyond like what you're alluding to is really interesting to think about and how that can truly inform and and uh, inspire how artists can be creative and, and creatively engage with their audience. Right. That'd be fun. When it comes to the monetization side, uh, as you take a sharp turn from the, the beauty of artistic integrity and fan right. engagement and go to the get that money. But outside of like Twitch subscribers, I mean, are you seeing any other interesting models when it comes to monetization? Like I know there's been some like pay-per-view and like I know there was like a Bloomberg article about like these promoters are making real money off their Zoom nightclubs. Like do you, uh, obviously there's like sponsors and like branded live streams. What do you see as the, the, the most valuable and, and uh, mechanisms of monetizing live streams? Right. So... It's, it's, it's so sad. Just the other day, we did a live, uh, a pay per view live stream with Papa Roach, right? Mm-hmm. I forgot Papa Roach a lot because they're like, I toured with them in my young life. They're uncles to my son. They're good friends, so we we collaborate a lot on things together. Um, and they did one, you know, on Saturday, and it was interesting to see that kind of the dynamic of it because there's, it, it's the experience is trying to replicate the live experience to a certain extent, right? So they have levels you have a ticketed one where you can watch it and there's some exclusive music they're doing something interesting and then there's a vip thing which includes like a zoom chat with the artist so they're they're trying to like emulate the tour world and it worked really well but the biggest thing that i've seen in it is you know we had 
in order to make it worth paying for, you got to step your game up. You can't just be in someone's living room. You can't, you know, you can't, you can't not put the effort in. So you, you know, we did a physical, physical production start to open back up. That was our first, that was our first like crew quote crew. Cause it was small, but that was our first crew that we had on the ground, you know, all the COVID rules, all the different ways of dealing with it. But you know, there was set design, there was lighting, there was all these different things that come into play that we're bringing back. So weirdly, I think the new normal will be something like that. I also think there's going to be this integrated, like weird, like you'll do a club thing with like a hundred people and the actually going to the show is going to be VIP and then you can watch it on the stream. So there's going to be all these different versions of monetization. I mean, that's more for like, you know, the super managers who, you know, we talk to a lot are figuring out and they're, they're also trying to figure out the landscape of what, you know, what's happening with the fact that the unemployment rate is so high, people's money is not going to be the same. Like mm. how do you, how do you, you know, it got to a place in festivals. I don't know if you went to many recently where there was so much VIP and so less GA that they had grown their VIP and, you know, which is good business. But now is anyone really going to pay $3,000 to go to Coachella for a weekend or, or, you know, is that many people? Cause there's gonna be a lot of people hurting after this, forget the virus, the economic impact of this, which trickles down to things like this is going to be massive. And I think artists are considering that. You know, like mm-hmm. the $5 ticket, the $10 tickets. You know, I think there's going to be a bunch of different models. Again, it's weird because you ask a, a good question and there's no good answer. Like, there's mm-hmm. so many there's so many different ways. And we're watching all these different artists working with, like, you know, the Veeps of the world, which are the Madden Brothers. They have their site that, you know, that they're doing the pay-per-view from, like, an artist's perspective. We just did one with this Norwegian company this weekend. So there's all these different pay-per-view models. I'm curious to see when like the big boys, like the AEGs and the live nations that have all of it built in ticketing, promotion, all of a sudden what they're going to do, but they mm-hmm. sat largely out at this point. So, you know, it'd be curious to see what they're looking at. They just keep delaying festivals, you mm-hmm. know, right. but they're not really doing anything to replace them because the artists are doing their own thing. So right. it, it, they were the power players, the superpower players in touring right now, artists have pulled some of that back on their own, you know? Right. Like, yeah. So, it's interesting. You know? I think that'll give artists more leverage in, in different deals. And uh, yeah, that should be yeah. exciting. Um, one kind of last thing to really dive into as well is the, um, when it comes to like you, I've obviously been working in media for a long time, a lot of experience with live streaming and whatnot, but like, I mean, you're essentially helping run a, a software company in, in, within the music industry. Like was um what's that experience been like? I mean, obviously software, I mean Mark Andreessen like wrote an article a while back, like software's eating the world and any single pocket of, or industry like where software isn't already, like we're only gonna continue to right. see like innovation and streamlined operations through software products. Like um what uh, what have you learned in the process of becoming like a software entrepreneur right. in, in the music industry? Right. I think I think it comes down to like creating the experience, right? So like our, what our software allows us to do is create really, is allows artists, let me rephrase rephrase that. Because really I've come from a lot of places like, you know, Access TV Live by Live, where it was about building those platforms, right? What's great about right now is we're working to empower artists and empower, you know, that individual world. All our software does is it makes it easier, less expensive to execute really creative ideas, right? So and that's what all software is supposed to do. It's supposed to make it easier, right? It's supposed to enhance and reduce costs. And that's what ours is doing right now. So where, you know, this last year, maybe we, you know, there was 10 festivals broadcast. Next year, festivals don't need to look outside to do their own broadcast. So they can do it just allows more people to get to market, right? I guess it's just a long way of saying it. It, it's, it allows the content to get out, to get out more, to get to the fan bases and more frequency than it would have in the past. So I mm-hmm. think running that's different because, you know, we work, you know, and it, our company's funny because, you know, there's all of us crazy people that have toured our whole life and lived with artists. There's coding engineers that don't understand us to save our life because when we, <laughs> when, 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 they, when, when the, what, what's our, what's our big line? We say like, um, but it's, but yeah, it's a fact that something didn't work right, but facts don't totally matter in the world of entertainment all the time. <laughs> like, so it, there's this weird convergence of things, which I think makes us really interesting though. Cause 
you know, our, our dev team and our tech guys, they know music, but they're super analytical and, the, and, and it's more about tech and making it work well. And then there's us who know enough tech to be dangerous, but have amazing relationships with the artists and that side. So I think it's a really interesting blend that hopefully makes the artist comfortable enough to like give, to do their art this way. And I think that's what tech does, right? Tech makes it easier. makes you comfortable because everyone was really apprehensive when this all started, right? Like it's in the cloud, I'm streaming. I don't know what people are doing. We don't see the, you know, like there's all this unknown. It's a new thing. And I think that we've been able to bridge that pretty good to bring tech humans, artists, fans all into one little piece, you know, which I think has been, been fun and interesting and God knows what's going to happen next week. Right. Right. Time will tell. Time will right. tell. That's exciting, man. Well, yeah. uh, Jordan, you got any last questions? Uh, no, I think that's it. I think that's it. I'm actually learning how to program right now, so I was super paying attention to to your answer to that, just to kind of hear how the music industry and the and the uh, the tech industry interact when they're obviously working in the same place. Um, I was I you know was on the phone call with somebody the other day from Spotify and he just kind of offhand said that you know he's connecting with the artists but if something's wrong with the program he's on Slack with all these developers and stuff <laughs> trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to fix things and it's just super interesting um I used to be a manager and just coming from that world where tech obviously plays a big role in a lot of things but for the most part we can kind of have a blind eye to it to then going to you know, potentially, and then and then kind of talking through these uh, music tech companies that all of a sudden have to figure out how to speak to developers to do the things that we do in the music industry. I just think it's all like super interesting. So, right. It's, it's I mean, and plus tech at the end of the day, right? Like we just did uh, Digital Mirage, and the biggest compliment we had from the festival promoters at the end of it is that they didn't even have to. They they knew nothing about the tech, and that's tech working right means that it did its job. They had no, they had no experience around our tech. They had mm -hmm. nothing to ask or talk about, and that's the best kind of tech, right? Like it did its job. It right. made life as promoters easier. They were able to focus on what they wanted to focus on, and that's. But I will say it's interesting watching like the Twitch world and music come together. That's a whole different thing we could talk about. <laughs> but it's, but I think it's you know it's 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 interesting to watch artists get closer to fans, and that's the number one goal of everything we're doing. You know. Right. 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 And ended on a strong note, Devin. Well, thank you so much, man. It's yeah. been a pleasure having you on. I'm excited to see yeah, you. Yeah, thank you for coming out virtually. Cool. I guess. Thank you. Let's uh let's get together and do something soon. Yeah. yeah. Sure, All right, sure. guys. Yeah, man, I thought that was an awesome episode. I think it was super timely, first of all, because live streams are all over the place right now. And I think the information that he gave us and he gave our audience will allow them to kind of stand out from the pack. One thing that I think, and I want to, you know, bring this up because we keep coming back to it every single episode is obviously the way we, the way you do a live stream, uh, your distribution, the way you market it is all very important. But one thing that, you know, if you've listened to a few episodes you've gotten is the theme, the general theme is you have to make good content. You have to make good music. You have to make, you know, music that attracts an audience. You have to also have to make good visual content, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that might sound repetitive, but hearing that from somebody who specializes in it, I think should drive that home for, for listeners as well. And I think he also gives ways to actually improve that content and, 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 and you know, real examples of it. So what yeah, do you think? Sure. You know, I thought it was lit. I thought, he has tons of incredible perspective on the live streaming market and the evolution and what's in store. And I think from ways to monetize to just general trends and shifts that we'll see in the music industry, I think is really, really fascinating. I'm also interested in what he was saying when it comes to like typically like Live Nation and AEG, all these major promotion groups had kind of like end-to-end -end ownership of a lot of the, the entire like touring side of the business. So now that artists are starting to do more live streaming and having more direct ownership of that relationship with their audiences, makes me think about how the tides may turn a little bit when it comes to artists having a little bit more leverage potentially being right. able to book their own shows get better rates get maybe equity right. or splits on any profit generated in their likeness so that to me was also exciting so excited to see how that plays out right but we do this for one reason that's for y'all that are tuning in so we appreciate you listening coming back another week you know where we'll be next week back in your ears <laughs> all right and on that note we are